thanks to the organizer for the possibility of being able to tell you a little bit about computation steps. My name is Fabian. I've been giving this presentation together with Peter. Uh, we want to do this jointly in order to orchestrate, maybe to show you a little bit how important it is to be collaborative also in the analysis. We try to do it in a ballet-like fashion. I'm not sure if you're going to make it, but please uh, help us a little bit work with that. Our task was to give you a little bit of an overview over the existing tools and also in particular then discuss with you what tools are not yet there that need to be, uh, need to be developed. But and this, I think, will be in particular important for the next breakout session tomorrow. So today I just want to review a little bit these computational steps for making and then also making use of an atlas. And uh, today I think just focus on uh, mostly RNA-seq since there's not so much imaging data available. So this will be uh, our usual workflow. We have a set of samples. We will be usually doing the pre-processing and then end up with our big count matrices. This is something, thanks to the DCP, uh, to the data coordination platform you will be hearing about in the next session. For now, we'll be doing as if we had already those count tables, and then we will be moving on uh, from that. So this is sort of a, a nice feature that the Atlas will give you at some point. Um, so typical first step is, we heard that quite a lot in also the single cell biology meeting over the past few days, that you have to do some batch correction, uh, uh, bring together data, visualize and cluster them, then potentially do some trajectories, and then I think a key point, do good and well annotation, potentially do it in a more standardized fashion and export that. And I think there's a lot to be done there in a systematic fashion. And then of, of course also include this in the spatial coordinate system to really speak about full Atlas system. I think a point that's interesting from the computational perspective is not only uh, to do these steps, but to do this iteratively in a dynamic fashion, maybe in such a way that you can actually update it without out, out sort of having to recalculate everything. So let me go through those steps uh, a, a, a bit. Let me start with batch correction without now giving, going into detail about all of the methods. Let me just highlight this one, uh, a picture here from uh, the Marioni lab work for by, 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 by Lale, where this idea is you, you have a set set of, of, of samples that are matching up in a few, maybe not in others, and you want to integrate them to get this merged data set. I think this is a task that we will have to be facing in order to, at the end, eventually stitch together a whole atlas. And there's, of course, a lot of correction methods around from bulk. There's a very nice review just coming, of a very nice idea coming up, taking bulk methods, but sort of adjusting them with single cell uh, uh, ex expression values to, to really make them, make them usable in the single cell setting. Of course, a lot of linear methods, and then uh, nonlinear ones such as this or, or from Marioni lab. And I just want to highlight this one point. Even before applying uh, uh, this, this type of uh, uh, bulk, uh, correction, very often we just look at T-sneeze and look, well, is this thing mixed or not? I think this is something that obviously doesn't scale across, I don't know, 10 or 100 batches, or maybe also across very complex tissues. So I think it's good to have some type of a means of quantifying these batch effects. And for this, one tool, for example, would be the statistical test that uh, my lab essentially developed where we look in, into a small region and count the number of cells from different batches and compare them to the overall statistics. Right, so with these types of corrections and alignments, you know, uh, pretty much in every, uh, every slide that you've seen today, uh, we see clusters of cells, right? So clustering is something that we do pretty much in every data set now, and it will certainly exist in the Atlas. And the reason we do this is to help sort of navigate the data. Um, uh, they basically become sort of units of interpretation, typically, uh, in some form. And they're also units of follow-up analysis, if you, let's say, comparing cases, controls, and so on. And the, um, let's see, the, the thing about clustering methods that there are a lot of them, right? That's usually doesn't get matched, you know, which algorithm was used and so on. And I'm not going to go through them, but there's a variety of methods that are being used currently in the papers that you see. And there are even sort of uh, uh, kind of consensus clustering methods like S3 that try to uh, run many of them. And so one of the issues we'll have to solve is basically uh, what type of clustering we'd like to agree on or happy to agree on or should we keep a multitude of clusters somehow. But that will certainly be one of the issues that will have to be resolved computationally. So, you know, on to sort of less track problems. Uh, so we're, most of these clustering methods, they're designed basically to work within a narrow scope of uh, either a single data set or a focused collection of data sets. And uh, what we would really like to have are collections. Let's say this is within the same tissue, right? Many samples within the same tissue. And here we consistently color every cluster with the same color, right? So we identify basically clusters across the entire tissue collection or maybe across an atlas of very different tissues. So such methods 
basically don't exist yet. So some beginnings of this uh, come with these batch correction methods, and, and hopefully they'll grow out into this. But this is certainly an area where we'll need more development. Um, the other thing to point out in these types of representations, there's kind of a necessary trade-off uh, between the resolution that you can get uh, and you can get very high resolution, let's say, within a focused tissue, within a very focused collection, uh, versus generality of these clusters that you, know, you can basically jump from one tissue to another across an entire atlas or maybe even organisms. So again, th this trade-off will be there and, and some form uh, will need to be handled by the atlas. Um, just to highlight some of the newer approaches, so there are actually a variety of, of methods as CVI, SAUCI, and uh, that are trying to use these neural network approaches to uh, come up with more flexible and scalable ways of, of clustering or classifying cells. So here, um, actually an approach from Fabian's lab, basically the idea is that uh, you have some kind of lat latent space coordinates that you project things to, uh, restricting it or, or basically regularizing it to uh, uh, keep the distances that we've seen in individual samples and individual tissues. An example here, basically this, this neural net was trained on, on a separate set of pancreas samples, and then we took two new pancreas samples and uh, it assigned some kind of clusters to them, put them in some kind of a distance me uh, metric, uh, and the, the samples, the cells from two different samples are actually reasonably well mixed, and that's what we'd like to see. Now, clustering is actually uh, intimately related with visualization, uh, so over, you know, over development of the last few years, I think there, there are many methods that, that are quite good at visualizing and allowing navigation of individual data sets. So we can go through clusters, through genes, through pathway patterns to find the, uh, sort of the interpretation of what's actually happening in the data. Now, much less explored, actually, um, uh, are these uh, uh, sort of multi-sample approaches. Uh, current approaches are basically focused on making either embeddings or some kind of heat maps, uh, and you can scale them up to very large numbers of cells. So here, 1.2 million neurons, for instance, from the uh, 10x data set, uh, but it's still a single tissue um, and, and uh, sort of a single sample eff effectively that's combined. Uh, for the atlas, we would actually would like to visualize across large collections of heterogeneous samples, those representing different, let's say, parts of the tissue or different uh, tissues entirely. And such visualization methods currently don't exist. Uh, furthermore, as we heard in the previous talk, you know, the, the spatial methods will actually add a lot of context to what's being shown here and, and with different cell types and clusters. And ideally, you would like to be able to visualize and navigate both in spatial dimensions and you know, in tissue organization anatomically and tissue organization transcriptionally. And again, I think it's a major challenge for visualization side of things. So I, I, like, cluster, I, I like clustering, but sort of the next step, particularly for developmental uh, situations, but also I think in very uh, many adult situations, is not looking for groups, but looking for tubes and more complex topologies in the data. And for this, obviously, approaches such as pseudotemporal ordering have been around. We've been discussing this at quite a few HCA meetings. The idea being that you start in your high dimensional uh, cell space and you look for trajectories and then have some way of, of averaging and then sort of representing an average behavior of cell dynamics. This is called pseudotemporal ordering. Very early algorithms such as Monocle and Wanderlust have made this hugely popular, and there's so many algorithms around that you can't even just summarize them. But I, I guess there's a very nice bioarchive paper just out that actually tries to systematically categorize them and actually benchmark them. I think I can really recommend uh, uh, looking at that. I just want to highlight this, 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 this one method that recently came out and I think has been discussed and taken up very quickly and maybe quite interesting also because of the bioarchive di dynamics intensely in the community is this idea of RNA velocity where in addition to the usual expression values that we instantaneously look at, uh, Peter and, 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 and Stan had the idea to look at unspliced reads, look at their ratio, and essentially fit a very simple uh, uh, gene expression model, and for, for this, predict where the cell will be in, let's say, two hours' time. And with this, they can actually find these sources and, the, the, and, and, and these sinks and, and learn a lot about these dynamics. And maybe the last point that I just want to make about clusters and trajectories is that in, in reality we would expect the topology of what's actually going on to be much more complex. There's a lot of latent variables such as cell cycle and so on go, uh, that are sort of confounding our data. You might decompose them with latent factor models, but maybe one idea is to actually look across all of these different type of of approaches that we could be taking and could be asking and maybe trying to get a sort of more unified uh, a picture of that. What's the more unified picture? Well, this would be, for example, that we have discrete topology. Here we have lines, here we have trees, here we have some type of circles, and here maybe just something that's even more complex. 
What is the, what's the idea? What's the unifi unification beyond that? I mean, this is a tool that computationally we have been using a lot, namely the single cell graph. This thing that will actually connect our, our, our cells, if we have some sort of more abstract way of coarse graining, would explain those topologies rather well. I mean, in the end, the topology is for us some type of visual interpretation that we need to make sense out of the data. And one idea that we, we've been pushing quite, quite a bit is now to sort of abstract this graph on a multi-level view and get some idea what, what's going on. And this is a tool that has been out in, in, in math, but is in a precise way, and you have to do some approximate version of that. The, the second, uh, extension where I will be super brief is the spatial axis. We, we saw this very nice in the previous talk that I think there's, there's a lot happening here. Early ideas were that we just take a very low dimensional sa sampling of space and then impute the single cell uh, large scale profiles based, based uh, uh, on a few uh, markers, but of course it would be also nice to directly measure it using different techniques from spatial transcriptomics. And I just want to highlight that on the computation side, there are a few approaches now to do for something like differential expression testing for non-trivial patterns that might be not as obvious. I mean, if you have two colors, then you can look by eye, but if you want to look for 10,000 uh, different genes and in terms of their patterning, you have to do something specific and ideas such as spatial DE from Ollie's lab and others, uh, uh, for example, uh, Guo Cheng who has been presenting this at the single cell biology meeting have been proposed. I think the key point here is that more data is needed and particularly also biological input in order to develop the, the tools in that direction. Okay, so uh, you know, given the, the size and the the breadth of the scientific community that we've assembled here in the Human Cell Atlas, we basically hope that the atlas will be not just a collection of many cDNAs, but sort of a projection of the expertise and our understanding of biology onto it. And, and so, you know, curation basically of the, of the cell types, cell states, and whatever we see in this data is, is a key process that I think we'll have to approach quantitatively as well. Uh, so first of all, we'll have to agree on sort of units of curation. Now we, again, going back to sort of clustering or grouping of cells, uh, it will have to be sort of satisfactory to different experts that are trying to um, annotate basically different processes happening in a cell. Um, and then the, the, the other thing to keep in mind that there's a variety of ways, a variety sort of a facets that, that could be annotated on this data, not just sort of major cell type separations, but also activity of these cells, uh, the influence that they're experiencing from the microenvironment and so on. So there are quite a few facets. And we, we have basically the expertise to do this, but uh, it, it is a difficult approach. So one of the things, you know, if we're doing this as a multi-expert sort of annotation exercise, uh, obviously the opinions of the experts will vary depending on their interests and, and their perspective on this. Um, and so hopefully, you know, we can come up with computational methods to actually facilitate this, both in terms of, you know, simple interfaces and databases and sort of communication tools and navigation tools that would allow experts to actually participate in this annotation and express their you know, opinion and justification for this, but hopefully also transitioning uh, into sort of machine learning approaches where we would actually start to create tools that could do these annotations automatically. Currently, there's really nothing that could annotate things from scratch, but given um, you know, a variety of sort of a, a database of you know, expert opinions, uh, we could move into sort of reconciling different opinions and actually finding common uh, trends in there and then identifying signatures that are robust enough that are supporting these opinions um, and hopefully come up with a well annotated atlas uh, that could be used in the future. So the part two sort of, of, of problems, computational problems, is, is using an atlas. And the idea here is that you'll have many views on the atlas and uh, the DCP talk uh, that's following us uh, will we'll talk about this in detail. So we have sort of many perspectives on this. Uh, we also have a breakout session tomorrow on computation at 9 a.m. where specifically we hope to discuss and, and solicit community input as to what types of uh, views on the human cell atlas and, uh, would be most useful. So just to give some vignettes here. I think the first very simple idea really shortly is as Aviv, I think, and, and Sarah very early pointed out, is what do we want to do? We want to map, or we want to identify now that we have a reference, what type of, our, in our experiment, what type of cells we have, what type of genes are relevant, what type of signatures potentially, and also maybe more complex, what type of tissue composition, particularly if you have a spatial context, is, is relevant. And uh, one idea is SC map from the Hamburg lab here, uh, from, from, uh, from Hingston, where you just map an existing 
uh, map onto an existing atlas some type of, uh, some, by some type of sim similarity measure your own data, and then you see and you can use this for potentially transporting annotation from the atlas into your data set. Another idea is to not only do a cell blast, but some type of signature blast. So in order uh, to use the atlas, you just take some annotation either from some existing database or also from a reference set. And this is just a very, very brief example. For a mouse atlas, we had 11 mice. We tried to look into some subclusters, and in this case, for example, we had one with only 32 cells. Cells, so on average per mouse, just two or three cells. We would not have been able to, to look and identify it in, uh, specifically if we just looked for our usual market genes, because in this case, we actually found a platelet and, and a platelet signature, which is some, something you wouldn't directly expect, at, at least naively not in lung. And interestingly, we found just half a year ago this, that there's platelet biogenesis apparently happening in lung. This was a nature paper early on, uh, just, just half a year ago. So you can actually, by reusing this typical bioinformatic database, you can find uh, a lot more. Yeah, so a couple of other kind of example use case, potential use cases is, for instance, selecting marker panels given a variety of restrictions that, that um, are needed for the problem. So for instance, for flow cytometry, if you actually found a subpopulation in the atlas you'd like to isolate, you'd like to be able to select markers. And again, if there are restrictions as to how many you know, antibodies you can use, which markers are accessible, for which you could get antibodies and so on, all of that could potentially exist as a sort of computational tool that you could easily access. Uh, sort of a related problem is, you know, going back to spatial transcriptomics, you know, many of these methods can accept a restricted number of probes, and so if you're trying to cover, let's say, as many populations as possible or, or cover sort of unclassified variability that exists within some of the stretched out clusters, you know, these types of algorithms could be designed uh, as portals where you could basically come in and, and formulate parameters of your restrictions of your spatial transcriptomic methods, and it would help you design the target genes and target probes. Okay, so just to summarize, I think going forward, the computational challenges, you know, some of them will be very technical, sort of being able to actually do these types of analysis and computations at scales. That means different algorithms that, that actually have complexity that, that can handle millions of cells that we expect, uh, and the platform implementations that I, I can scale in terms of both volume and computational uh, productivity. Uh, the, the tools and organizational tools and, and, and sort of analytical tools for uh, creating uniform cell type and state uh, descriptions is going to be a major challenge. Some of this is, is organizational, us having to agree on terminology, ontologies, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it, I think, will we'll, we'll move into machine learning to be able to sort of learn from that initial knowledge and, and move this forward to many applications. Uh, there are very substantial, I think, visualization challenges that will need to be met in order to make this effective. Um, the, in terms of use cases, obviously, you know, optimization of experimental design for both the creation and, and, uh, and, and sort of additional experiments. For instance, if you wanted to compare a disease case with, with the normal annotations here, you know, these types of computational tools will, will need to be created. And, and there are a lot of problems related to integration of spatial transcriptomics and, and, and using its potential. Um, so we're hoping to basically leverage the, the very active computational community around here, including many students and postdocs. So I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to the first uh, jamboree that we had here um, last year, uh, our organized by HCA working analysis group. Uh, we had a number of, uh, of postdocs and students working here for a few days to address you know, specific problems related to all this. Okay, I think that's it, thank you. So annotation is an iterative process and all these different opinions and all of a sudden a little breakthrough insight. So having a method by which we can see the, the you know, get a cookie crumb trail of the, the annotations and have it be an interactive process, is that in your regard? Yeah, I, I, I think this is the basis that's needed to actually you know, get community input um, and, and both you know, having the database of annotations uh, as well as you know, justifications and I guess some history as well. Um, and then you know, both on the community side, at some, at somehow this process will, will be, get reconciled, but also I think this will create an extremely important resource for machine learning to actually move this forward in a more automated fashion. I, th I think we just should do it as we do it now, that every lab is sort of generating its own tool or sort of micro annotation, but really have to have a community approach to sort of get the best out of all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you very much.